Good morning and welcome to our service, whether you're watching it live or whether you're watching it recorded on Facebook or YouTube, you are most welcome and we trust that it will be a time of blessing for you. Our service this morning is led by the Reverend Kevin Hook, who is the superintendent of our circuit. So without more ado, I will hand over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and uh, welcome to you, welcome to you all. The psalmist said, "Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to Lord aloud to the Rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving, and extol Him with music and song, for the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods." And so shall we praise God as we sing together our opening hymn, which Jeff has chosen for us. My Jesus, my Saviour, 103 in mission praise, 1003 in mission praise. Say 
let us pray. With all your people on earth and heaven, we praise your name, O God, for you alone are worthy of adoration. Majestic and glorious, encircled in light, radiant in splendor, stupendous in love, rich in mercy, abounding in grace, you reign supreme beyond space and time. In you is the fullness of perfection. In you is our hope of salvation. In you is the promise of eternal life. With all your people on earth and in heaven, we praise your name, O God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Forgive us, God of mercy, for our narrow and limited vision and our reluctance to trust in what we cannot see. Forgive our preoccupation with the here and now and our failure to seek the things above. Forgive our earthbound thinking and our feeble sense of the communion of saints. Rekindle in us by your Holy Spirit the sacred fire of your love and remind us of the things eternal, that with clean hands and pure hearts we may serve you faithfully on earth and come at last with all your saints to the peace and joy of heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There is a response to the prayer of thanksgiving if you care to share it. When I say blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour, the response is be to our God forever and ever. Blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour, be to our God forever and ever. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all its inhabitants. Blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour, be to our God forever and ever. Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb, who has taken away the world's sin. Blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour, be to our God forever and ever. God has shown his love for us by sending his only Son, who lived and died and rose again, that we might have eternal life. Blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour be to our God forever and ever. The souls of the righteous are safe in God's hands. They are at peace. They abide in his love. Blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour be to our God forever and ever. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called his children. The holy ones of the Most High shall possess the kingdom forever. Blessing and glory, thanksgiving and honour, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The Collect for today. Almighty God, you have knit together your chosen people in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those inexpressible joys which you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Christine, for those prayers. Last Sunday's lectionary gospel reading was one of my favourite passages from the New Testament, um, the story of blind, blind Bartimaeus receiving his sight. And so I thought, rather than just read the story and then we preach upon it, I will talk our way through it and reflect upon it as we go. I hope that's okay. Sometimes we hear a gospel passage 
and we fail to actually to attend to it when we just hear it being read. So this morning we'll read through it a bit more slowly and reflect on it as we go through. I don't know the words of the passage. Oh, you've, 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 you've stopped sharing the screen. That's fine. Okay. Um, in which case, I will read two bits of it and then we will then we'll reflect as we go along. So it starts with them passing through Jericho. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And so that sets the scene for us, really, doesn't it? Jesus is passing through Jericho. He's actually on his way to Jerusalem because the next story in the gospel is the triumphant entry into Jerusalem that we know and hear about on Palm Sunday. So we're right at the tail end of Jesus' public ministry. So he's on a journey and there are his disciples, of course, and then a large crowd. And then we hear about Bartimaeus. Um, and we hear that he's a blind man, and we hear that he's sitting by the roadside begging. Last Sunday morning, we had a family service at Ippelpen, and uh, we acted out the story in a COVID-secure sort of way. Um, and so we had um, one young lad who volunteered to be Bartimaeus. And so I told him what Bartimaeus was like, and he took up a position that sort of represented Bartimaeus. And we can imagine what that sort of posture would indicate about Bartimaeus. He is blind and he is begging and he is sitting by a roadside. In other words, to be blind in those days can be marginalized. It can mean that you are likely to be poor. It's likely that you are going to be dependent on others. It's likely also that actually you're going to feel pretty low about yourself, not only because of your poverty and being dependent, but also in those days, sometimes disease and disability was seen as a sign of God's displeasure. And so for all those reasons, Bartimaeus' self-esteem, we would assume, is low, but certainly he is marginalised. But when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, is quite a strong sort of phrase about Jesus, isn't it? I don't think anybody else in Mark's gospel calls Jesus son of David. David, of course, is the Old Testament king that everybody remembered with strength and with affection, a great leading light in the, the people of Israel. And a son of David is a messianic title. It's a title proclaiming that the Messiah, the son of David, has come. It's a political sort of thing as well as a religious sort of thing, really. When you think about it, in just under a week's time, Jesus is going to be executed publicly in Jerusalem, and he's going to be known as Jesus, the King of the Jews. Bartimaeus hails Jesus as a coming king. And so there's something about this part of the story, which is about who has sight and who has insight in this story. Everybody else in that scene has physical sight, and yet perhaps they don't perceive Jesus to be the person that he is. And yet here is blind Bartimaeus, unable to see physically, and yet sees with his heart and with his mind. And I wonder where we find people who have insight in the world around about us today. Sometimes they may not be the people that we expect. Sight and insight are different things. And so he calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And many rebuke him and told, tell him to be quiet, to shut up. And I wonder why they do that. Why do they tell Bartimaeus to pipe down? Is it maybe that he's saying something that is very controversial? Son of David, the Messiah. Do we really want Jesus to be hailed as that at this point? 
that's a bit difficult, especially as they're drawing close to Jerusalem. Be quiet, Bartimaeus, don't say these things. Or is it that they tell him to shut up just because he's poor old Bartimaeus? He's only the blind beggar. Jesus has far more important things to be doing, far important people to be seeing and attending to than Bartimaeus. Who is he to call out and hail Jesus amidst this, this procession passing through the town? Just Bartimaeus. Be quiet, Bartimaeus. You are totally unimportant. This is not your space and time to be shouting out. Maybe it's an embarrassment. But Bartimaeus doesn't shut up. Bartimaeus calls out all the more with the same phrase. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so the text then goes on to say that Jesus stops and calls him. And that sense of Jesus stopping, I think, is quite an important little bit in the gospel. Because let's remember, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's on to the last week of his life. He's going to face rejection, death on a cross. Absolutely horrific. The last story before this one, Jesus is having to tell off his disciples, particularly James and John, but the rest of the, and the rest of them, because they're arguing on the way. They're arguing about prominence and who's going to have the most important seats, who's the most important among them. And so this is so close to Jesus' death that he has to hand over his work onto his disciples. And he really needs them to get it at this point, to understand who he is and what he's about. And they have failed to do that. And so all those things must be weighing heavily on Jesus as he draws near to Jerusalem and as he passes through Jericho. So much in his head, so much to preoccupy him. And yet, despite all that, he stops. And I don't know how it is for you and me, or how it is for you. I know it is for me that when I have a lot on my mind and a lot of things buzzing around in my head, particularly the things that I need to do in the next day or coming days, stopping and noticing other people is one of the things that is likely to go out of the window. We get so wrapped up in our busyness and the things that are important to us that sometimes we fail to listen to others we, sometimes we fail to give attention to others, but Jesus does not. Jesus stops and calls Bartimaeus. He is not too preoccupied. He is not too busy to notice and to notice somebody calling out to him and somebody in need. So Jesus calls him. And so now the crowd are a bit more interested. So they call to the blind man, cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, Bartimaeus jumped to his feet and comes to Jesus. And Jesus says something which, on the face of it, is quite remarkable. Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I mean, isn't it obvious here is a blind man begging by the street. Isn't it clear what he's going to ask of Jesus? Everybody else who would ask for a, a coin or two or a bit, of ha a bit of a handout or a bit of help. But this is Jesus. Surely it is obvious what he is going to ask for. So why does Jesus bother to ask? Well, maybe it's because... Sometimes it's important to express what's going on inside us. Sometimes it's important to express to God who we are, what we're going through. Sometimes when you express something in articulating it, you make it clear for yourself, you sort it out for yourself. And sometimes actually when you have to articulate something, actually you know what your need is. You put into words that which is in your head and you express your need. Please help me, I want help with this. Actually, it's a far stronger statement than just, I can't cope with this. So maybe Jesus helps him by asking him to express out loud what it is he wants. 
but maybe also Jesus just gives Bartimaeus a voice. Up until now, he's just been blind Bartimaeus, poor old Bartimaeus. We might have pity for him. We may have feel sorry for him, but actually he is powerless. He's dependent. He has no voice of his own. And so maybe at this point, Jesus gives voice to somebody who would otherwise be unnoticed, unheard, not listened to, not valued. And so if that is the case, I wonder who today we need to give a voice to. Who do we need in our churches, maybe? In our social friends? In our society? Who do we need to hear that perhaps we don't hear, that we don't give attention to? Who sometimes doesn't have the opportunity to speak out? Sometimes even in our church meetings, there are voices which we hear frequently. And there are voices which we don't hear in our meetings. They stay quiet. Maybe we need to attend to those people's opinions and ideas and thoughts as well. But also in our wider society, there are people that actually need to be given a voice. Maybe for all these reasons, Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Blind man says, Rabbi, I want to see. And the story finishes with Jesus saying to him, go, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. And that little phrase on the road is in Greek, ente hodo, uh, which is a bit of a pun because it kind of means to the Christian church on the Christian way, on the Christian road. We talk about a spiritual journey and it has that same sense of he follows Jesus, not just on the road, though he does that, but on the spiritual journey, on the Christian path. So grateful is he that he will follow Jesus. And remember that following Jesus for Bartimaeus at this point means heading towards Jerusalem and the last week of Jesus' life. That's not an easy time to start being a disciple of Jesus. And yet that's what he does. And we know that's what he does. And we know that he follows through with that because when Mark comes to write down his gospel at the beginning of the story, it's not just any old blind man. This blind man is identified. He is Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, which kind of suggests quite strongly that when Mark came to write this down a generation or so later, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was known to Mark's community and to the Christian church. This is the man that you have heard of. This is the man that you have known. And so there's something about Bartimaeus' insight. There's something about his faith. There's something about his gratitude that gives him courage to follow Jesus wherever that takes him. Not only when it's going to be easy, but also when it's going to be tough. And I wonder what that says about our faith and our courage and our gratitude for all that Jesus has done for us. That we should follow him, not only when the skies are blue, but also when it's pouring down with rain. That God's love in Jesus will always see us through and will not let us go. But we have to have the courage to hold on to that and to keep on following. And so this story is literally, what, six, seven verses in Mark's gospel. But it seems to me there's a great deal that's packed into it. All sorts of potential messages for us. So instead of me telling you what you need to, 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 to get from this reflection on the story, I'm going to leave it a little open-ended so that you can continue to reflect and work out 
what you think is the most important bit for you. Is it that question of where do we find sight and insight? Is it about the restoration and the giving of life to somebody who at the beginning of the story was marginalized and poor and dependent, but now is valued and independent? Is it about that sense of we need to keep following Jesus and being disciples when it's easy or when it's hard? Is it about that sense of uh, Bartimaeus being given a voice? And who do we need to give a voice to? Who do we need to listen to in our society? Who are the marginalized in our society? Is it about that sense of, well, when I am busy, I know that I put everything else to one side and I forget other people. And actually, I need to remember that Jesus stopped on this journey with everything else that was going in his head. For you and for me, any or all of those points might be the points that we need to continue to reflect on as we go through this week. So I'm going to leave that to you. When I thought about a hymn to follow the story of Bartimaeus, there was one, of course, which came immediately to mind, and that's what we're going to see. It's number 31 in Mission Praise, if you want to follow the words there, but they'll obviously be on the screen. And it is the familiar words of amazing grace.
reading from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 to 9, reading from the NIV version. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace all of the earth, from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trust in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trust in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John. I've chosen that reading about the wiping away of every tear and uh, the place and the hope of eternity and the place of God's love and permanence because today's Halloween, which means tomorrow is All Saints Day when we remember the saints of the church. And it's followed on November the 2nd by All Souls Day, which is about remembering all those who have gone before us, who are not the named saints of the church, but nevertheless are the people of God. And uh, it always seems to me, to me important at this time of the year to remember those who have gone before us in faith and in life. And maybe to remember those who are particularly the saints of our own lives. I don't know whether you watch Who Do You Think You Are? I think it's a fascinating programme as people delve into their past and find out more about their forebears and what have made them uh, become the people that they are. It was Alex Scott um, last week. He went all the way to Jamaica and found things in her past that she was pleased about and some that kind of upset her, really, um, because there were th things that happened in her past, uh, in her family's past, that she would have disagreed with today. Um, but nevertheless, she said, you know, that's helped make me the person that I am. And uh, we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And so in a moment or two, Jeff's going to play a piece of music for us. And I just want us to spend some time remembering the saints of our own hearts and our own lives, those maybe with a, within our own families, but also those within our church family, those who have gone before us, whose um, companionship along our pilgrimage has helped shape us, and helped enrich us and encourage us. Maybe also remember others who are dear to us, friends, neighbours, whoever they are, but those people who have been the saints of our lives. And so we have a couple of moments now with some music just to reflect and to call them to mind and to say words of gratitude and of love, and to hold them in our hearts um, and to, to, to remember them before God and in our fellowship together. And after that, then I will have a, I'll say a couple of verses from scripture and then we'll have our prayers. So Jeffrey.
Thank you, Jeffrey. And so Paul wrote, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so let us pray. And so, Father God, on this eve of all saints, and then All Souls Day, we offer you our thanks and our praise for those whom we have just remembered, the saints of our own lives. We thank you for your love that held them and holds them now and will never let them go. We thank you for their companionship, their example, their support, their love, all that they have given to us, all that they always will mean to us. For all these things, Father God, and for all these people, we express our gratitude and our joy to you. And Father, as we remember those who have been a part of our lives, and we remember the past, so we hold before you the present. We come before you on this Halloween when people mark darkness. And so we hold before you those who live with the darkness of fear. Those who live with the darkness of poverty. those who live with the darkness of injustice. We pray for those who are unwell. We pray for those who are bereaved. We pray for those who carry heavy burdens. We pray for those who have big decisions to make. We pray for those who are carers in our society, either professionally or informally. And Father God, we hold them before you, knowing that darkness is not dark to you that you are present in our darkness and in the darkness of the world. We pray for your transformation, your healing, your hope, your wisdom. And oh, Father, as we hold before you the past and those who have gone before us, as we hold before you the present, so we hold before you also the future. And in particular, we hold before you the COP26 meeting. Those who will attend. We pray that our leaders will have courage to do what is right. That you would guide them and lead them. That our planets may be more sustainable. We pray for the continuing outworking of public policy in our own land and elsewhere. That people may not be marginalized, but strengthened. Might receive the practical support and the inner strength that they require. And Father, we hold before you the coming days and weeks in our own lives, the people we shall spend time with, the tasks that will be ours. And we ask for an openness to your spirit and your love and your grace at work within us, that we might live well for you and serve your purposes and your kingdom. 
and help us so to remember the saints in light, those who have gone before us, that their example and their influence for good may continue to shape our lives and who we are. And Father, we offer you all these are our prayers, not in our own strength, but in Jesus' strength, not in our goodness, but through your grace. And we offer them in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And our closing hymn this morning, fittingly enough, I think, for all saints and all souls, days is a hymn reminding us of the glory of resurrection. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering son, 689, if you're using mission praise. <laughs> Thanks to all those who have taken part in this uh, morning service and to Jeffrey for sorting out the technicalities and for guiding us through it. 
and a prayer to finish with. Grant us, O God, in all our duties, your help. In all our perplexities, your guidance. In all our dangers, your protection. And in all our sorrows, your peace. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, remain with us and those we carry in our hearts this day, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>